Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Tony Hay. I'm co-founder of Responsible Investor. Um, it's my pleasure to be presenting this Responsible Investor webinar today, um, being broadcast in partnership with Vincent and Elkins LLP. Um, today's webinar is titled 2022 Sustainable Finance Outlook. Investors have been driving change now. Um, particularly, we are going to be discussing how companies are increasing their focus on best practice and sustainable debt markets um, as the banks and investors pivot towards ESG. Um, and I'll be introducing today's panel um, very shortly. Uh, but first, just um, a couple of messages. The first one, commercial message for responsible investor. Um, if you don't know who we are, please do take out a free trial today or, or any day that you wish to. Um, you'll get access, therefore, to our news, features, um, jobs and reports. Um, and there is a link in, in the download section, which you'll see uh, on the right hand side there, or depending on how your screen is set up, perhaps at the bottom, where you can go to responsibleinvestor.com slash trial to do that. Moving on to making the best from the webinar, um, please do feel um, free to um, ask questions using the Q&A tab. Um, any questions you do ask come into us anonymously, so don't worry about your name um, being read out. Um, if you have questions for a specific panelist, please do drop their name into the questions so that we know who to direct it to. Sometimes we'll, we'll drop a question in here or there if, if it's a case of clarification um, during the panel session. That'll be up to the moderator, um, but most of them will be held towards the end and, and we'll go through them then. Um, there is one attachment, uh, which I've already mentioned in, um, in the download section, uh, which is the attachment that helps you to take the free trial to um, Responsible Investor. And we've decided not to put these slides in because there's nothing here apart from the housekeeping slides. Um, you will, of course, be able to review um, the recording after it's finished. Um, this webinar will be available on demand within about an hour and um, you'll be sent a link by email so if you've had to leave for some reason you can finish off the webinar or you can watch again or of course you can share um, with colleagues when it comes to that okay so moving on to the panel themselves it's my very great great pleasure to be welcoming um caitlin snelson who is a senior associate of finance at vincent and elkins uh, noel hughes who's partner finance at vincent and elkins Will Prentice, who's an investment analyst at Wellington Management, and Michaela Seaman, who is executive director, sustainable debt strategist at UBS. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Good to be here. Great, great to be with you. Nice to be here with you. Thank you. So we're going to start with a, a scene setting Q&A, which is going to be between me um, and Caitlin, uh, which is aimed at providing an overview of, of recent ESG developments and, and really serves as an introduction to the panel. Um, the panel then will be um, run as moderator by Noel Hughes. Um, and then finally, we'll go to Q&A. So I'm just going to remove um, the slides here. So we go back to the, um, the, the grid section. Um, Caitlin. 2020, 2021 um, have been pretty extraordinary years um, for, for everybody, regardless of what industry that they're working in. What makes them stand out for you from an ESG perspective? Yeah, and Tony, I appreciate the intro. This is scene setting. This is also uh, letting me get out all my nonlinear thoughts uh, before we move into the panel. So better for everyone this way. You know, I think anyone who Googles anything or just opens LinkedIn or, or opens any news site is going to see a headline about sustainable finance, um, green bonds, sustainably linked bonds. You just can't really avoid it. And, uh, you know, the numbers themselves are really striking. So I've, I've got my figures here, so I don't miss them. But to in 2020, there were uh, 700 billion done in sustainable uh, debt issuances, which doubled the 2019 number. Then in 2021, we got to 1.6 trillion. Uh, more than doubling 2020. Uh, and within all of that, you just saw quarter on quarter records being set. And so those numbers are really striking. They show up and to the right, you know, pretty significantly. But I think they're kind of like, it's an old story a little bit. Like, if you have a new record every single quarter, like, it's very exciting, but we kind of get it. Like, this is here, it's growing, it's growing really fast. Um, but I think what those numbers show is rapid growth. And what the, the interesting conversations are is what does that rapid growth mean for participants? Um, and, and how is that taking shape? So just 
from a personal perspective. I was sharing with you earlier, you know, early in 2020, I read like a market update and there was one paragraph about uh, sustainable debt. And I read it and I was like, this sounds cool. I, uh, I sent an email around the firm asking, you know, who was working on it, who was writing about it, who was active on it. And I jumped on a client alert we were doing. And for me, that has from that client alert and follow 2020, now I'm here doing this panel uh, with you all. And so for me, that's like rapid growth, right? That's my personal story. You know, the, the resources uh, in this uh, process of doing this client alert, we later did a primer. We started putting together a database of, um, of deals, an internal database so we could track what was going on, um, you know, what KPIs were being measured in sustainability linked issuances, where deals were getting done, Europe, Asia, the US. And uh, Saturday or Sunday, I logged on to legal commentary and data for a completely different deal. And I saw on the right hand side, their uh, leveraged ESG leveraged uh, finance tracker with all that information right there. And I, uh, I haven't told the associates yet who were helping me on that huge project that someone else is already doing it for us. But that just shows you like, this rapid growth, rapid availability of resources, growth in conversation, um, you know, and what that means for every player, I think is really interesting. I, I think it has also created a bit of a, a frenzy almost, um, you know, people wanting to get in before it's not new and before it's just the debt markets. It's not the sustainable debt markets, And that kind of frenzy is coupled with increasing scrutiny and, and questioning of, okay, but what does this mean for me? You know, how do I measure the impact of this investment? Uh, are these the right standards we're using? And so it's a really interesting time where there's this massive, massive and rapid growth, um, you know, lots of entry into the market and at the same time, scrutiny and, and questioning. Okay. Very good. That, 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 that's a great start. I mean, you, you refer to your um, long experience as, as an advisor in, in, in regular debt markets. Do the ESG debt markets feel the same to you as any other asset class, or do you think there are big differences? You know, in terms of the documentation, so just wearing my finance lawyer hat, like it, to do one of these deals is not that different or that complicated. Um, you're inserting sustainability link provisions, you know, probably takes up a page, maybe two pages of whatever document that you're working on. So from a deal execution documentation, I shouldn't say execution standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what is less straightforward and what is different is what the nuances of those provisions, um, as well as who the different players are you're talking to. So. I think this, the ESG debt markets are bringing together professionals and advisors in who didn't work together beforehand. Um, that's true for me with working with some of our environmental climate change focused attorneys, working with people in the regulatory space. And it's also true, I think, at companies themselves. I, I was in a conference and I forget which company it was now, but the CFO was saying, you know, one of the interesting things about doing their sustainable debt issuances was that it was people at their company who had never worked together before were now working together on a project. And then it was really beneficial for um, for the company and uh, it itself. So I think that's one interesting thing. You know, the other thing is that it's just new and it's kind of the Wild West a little bit. Um, you know, like I said, everyone wants to do it. Some people are starting to question okay, just because, you know, four people did it, like four people isn't really compelling to me to say that I should do exactly what four, only four other people ever did, right? And so, you know, the provisions are, are developing, you know, what makes sense to be included are, is developing, um, you know, new people are coming into the market with standards to measure against certifications. Um, and so it, it's rapidly changing and it's, it's kind of fun. It's also kind of scary because there's no right, one right way to do something, right? And uh, 
which is exciting to get to be creative a little bit, but scary because sometimes you're just, you know, making something up and here's my argument on why it makes sense. Okay. Um, th th there's a couple of things in there which are really worth picking up on and, and the use of the expression Wild West um, is kind of scary in some ways, um, especially when you, you talk about people making things up. I know you don't mean that in the most literal sense. Yeah. Um, that that would be pretty challenging for for large organizations that have a lot of resources and, and they have the staffing to really think about this in, in depth. It, it must frighten off or scare off or really put off the, the, the smaller firms, medium size and small firms who want to raise sustainable debt, but just can't figure out how they should be getting into it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's starting to change a little bit because more and more kind of, I'll call them like third party resources are, are available. And so there, there's more, um, you know, external resources you could bring in to help you uh, do an issuance. And I think we're seeing it trickle down out of just purely in the investment grade space now because of that, including, you know, at investment banks, like they have more built out teams where they can support issuers um, who are out of the investment grade space. But yeah, I mean, look, like some of these issuers have sustainability teams, you know, they've got a team of like, 10, 20 people who work on these and who work on it for the company internally and others, you know, it, it's the finance team. It, it's, it's nobody new. It's people taking on more on their regular job, trying to figure out how to navigate this space. Um, so there are, there are definitely challenges. You know, there are also additional costs and, and steps that have to be taken to do one of these issuances. And, the smaller in, in dollar amount you go, the more questions around, okay, well, are those extra transaction costs worth it? Um, especially where you see, you know, in the sustainability link space, the, the pricing adjustments are pretty small, right? And so query if the costs outweigh the benefits from like an economic perspective, like purely economic perspective, um, and I think that can be a challenge um, for, for some companies as well. Okay, but are people stepping up to, to fill the void as it were? Are there people coming up with services that are gonna answer the questions that the, the, the smaller organizations have got and help them to come to market? I, I think so. So, you know, we're talking about organizations like companies, but there's also investors and there's lenders and credit funds who are having the same desire to be in the market right and they are looking at how do we compete with you know some of these bold back bracket banks that can offer just like really low interest rate margins on this debt and so while there's challenges for um you know smaller mid and mid cap companies there's also challenges for, um, you know, investors and lenders outside of the bold bracket banks who want to get in this space. And at some point, you know, I would have to imagine that there's they're going to converge, right? One's going to offer a solution for the other, um, and there's going to be real opportunity there. Uh, so I, I think that we're going to start to see different solutions arise. Um, you know, in this space. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, we're going to be, I, I can see the panelists nodding their heads there. So it, it's going to be good because I know they're going to come on, want to come in on a lot of the things that you're saying. But um, before we move on to the panel, what, what, what do you hope we're going to see come out of the discussion today? What, what, what are you hoping to, to be hearing um, from the panelists, including yourself? Yeah, I think as I kind of, intimated in the very first question what is so much more interesting now than the numbers and the issuances are the the conversations and the experiences that all of us are having at different points of the food chain and everyone is having to problem solve real time um in this space so i'm really excited to hear from will and michaela about you know what they're seeing and how they're advising people and and the challenges that they're facing and, and their views and 
um, having those conversations is really the interesting story here. So I'm excited okay. to uh, chat more. Very good. All right. So, so we'll get that to that in a moment. I'm, I'm going to say back to the audience again, don't forget um, questions. I will be keeping an eye on, on the questions to have there as we move along. But I'm going to hand over now to Noel. Noel, you're, you're going to be moderating the panel. So I'll mute Thanks, myself um, and I'll give it off across to you. Yep. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. So look, I think, uh, you know, we're going to just start to kick off the conversation with maybe a bit of an obvious question. But, you know, helpful to hear from Will and Michaela. What, what are you finding is driving the, the demand for ESG amongst your, your client base? And in particular, you know, how are, how are your clients thinking about where green finance, sustainable finance, these types of products fit in into a kind of a portfolio, an impact portfolio, or just their broader portfolio? Michaela, do you want to maybe start off with that one? Okay, ladies is first. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, yeah, it, I mean, this is really the question. And I was thinking early on when I saw the title, like, um, um, Investors Driving the Change Now, I think it shifts a little bit now. So we got from the investor base a bit to the issuer base, but I think we come later on to that. I think what is really gri uh, driving the demand is really, it's it's, an awareness. So we all have an awareness now. So as Kathleen really um, rightly said, it's like, I mean, personally, I'm also a longer time in, in this market. I'm, I was accompanying the first green bonds issued in 2006 and seven. When you were talking to investors back then about this, they were looking at you with blank eyes and saying like, what are you talking about? I'm not interested. I don't have the capacity. We don't have funds. We have nothing like this. But now it changed completely. So now it's really like from... I'm personally in the in the global wealth management side of the business. We have retail investors. So even if they were quite critical before, but now we had with the COVID situation, really a mind shift taking place, right? So it's really like you think about your life, your environment, you think completely differently. And this you want to be reflected in the whole value chain of your life. So it really means like you want to not only live more sustainable, but you want to invest also more sustainably. Mm -hmm. So with this demand, which also is like met by actually quite good performance we have seen in the financial market, markets. It also means that the fund industry is also growing in this sense, right? So there's more products out there. I can choose more. I can be more diversified. We have regulators coming in, governments having made pledges over the past years. This is reflected in regulation. So it's like we came from, a. I don't want to say it's niche. It was always there. We always are like, not always, but we had for a, more than 100 year really sustainable investing. But now it's everywhere. It's in a whole value chain. There there is third party providers in, in all kind of different aspects available. And this whole infrastructure, which we didn't have before, is really a little bit of a self driver. And before I hand over to Will, I want to pick up a point what Kathleen said before is about the um, the companies it actually also comes out of the company environment because the question was like how do smaller medium-sized companies actually action with this mm. remember these are business owned right so these are partly family owned and there are strong values with on a personal level right now so there's a rethinking process going on there as well so these companies are also thinking differently about um, how they have to deal with the whole sustainability topic and also if they want to hand on to the next generation the next generation of different demands and also if they want to if you want to sell your business there is another demand if you're part of supply chain there is a demand there so this whole infrastructure really changes the whole demand about um, sustainability um, you know from an investment and from an issuer perspective yeah super super interesting will do, do you have anything to add there and I suppose that's that's a bit that uh, Michaela touches on something which is also rel very relevant, which of course is that a lot of people look at green finance, sustainable finance from a perspective of net zero and, and maybe environmental policies. But you know, the part that Michaela rightly says is there's a future proofing element of this for people as well, right? Where they they want their their investments to be future proofed from a, you know, the, this is the way the, the world is traveling and, and making sure that you're 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 on the train really is 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 is, is important. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think just to just to reiterate um, Michaela's point on the on the personal side, I think the individual has realized that they can harness the power of capital markets to do good. And there is, as Michaela said, a complete mindset shift. And that is also transferring into the beneficiaries of, of pension schemes. And it's lead, led to also a mindset shift on the institutional side. So a lot of institutions now, they have their own climate and sustainability goals. There's initiatives such as the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, in which these um, asset owners are committing to have their um, assets managed against net zero by 2050. So all of that is translating into a huge demand shift, um, increase in demand for these um, sustainable finance, these sustainable debt instruments. Now, I just want to pick up sort of on the second point of your original question, which was regarding how these securities can fit into portfolios. Right. I think the way I like to, to phrase it is that they're a complement to existing existing securities in the market. So I'm going to speak from the perspective of, of impact, but what we're looking to do is generate impact across a variety of themes. So that's social and environmental themes. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found in the labeled market, a lot of it at the moment is tilted towards the green, the environmental themes. And we can complement that by investing in traditional securities, such as municipal bonds, where we can address a healthcare or, or education, for example. Um, and overall, that can result in investments which address this really broad range of themes. Um, so overall, yeah, I like to say that, that they complement each other um, quite nicely. Yeah, that's great. Super helpful. Um, so we're talking, we're talking about, you know, there's, there's different terms we're using here when we're talking about so it's impact investing, which I, I, I think, as you rightly point out, well, is, is more, it's not just the greens, it's also social. Um, we're, we're talking about sustainable debt. We're talking about green bonds. Maybe, Caitlin, I'm going to ask you, when we're talking about sustainable debt, what are, you know, currently, what's your view on what's perceived as the best practices and how, how should companies start maybe thinking about how they would line up an issuance with that best practice? And then separately, maybe I would ask, once you've said, talk to that, whether I would ask maybe Michaela uh, and Will, to what extent they're seeing um, an increased sophistication around some of their clients about whether they want to look for more for like green bonds versus sustainable finance versus the different types of across the kind of impact finance landscape, how, how they see clients now moving there. So I'll start with you, Caitlin, around kind of best practice and, and, and just talking people through sustainable debt. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I like the term like labeled products. So within sustainable debt on labeled products, we have what we'll call use of proceeds instruments or, um, you know, activity based instruments versus uh, like behavior based instruments, which are sustainability linked. So on the use of proceeds, activity based, we're talking about green bonds, social bonds and sustainable bonds, which is kind of like a mix of the two. And uh, on the behavior base, we're talking about sustainability linked. Um, and so more specifically on the green bonds, you're, you're using the proceeds for a eligible green project or an eligible social project, eligible sustainable project. And you know, each of those dollars that is raised should be used for that project. The behavior-based sustainability linked instruments are more of a transition instrument. So there are ESG goals that are um, you know, KPIs, key performance indicators that are included in the instruments um, with, with targets that you're either going to meet or you're not going to meet. And you know, your pricing will fluctuate um, you know, depending on success or failure. Uh, so an example might be you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's probably the most common one. And if you meet your goal, then you know maybe it, it's sometimes constructed as a uh, you know a reward where your pricing will go down. Sometimes it's a penalty. You failed, your pricing will go up. Sometimes you have you have both. Now on both sides, um, there are guidelines that are out there which everyone follows, I think, basically now. Um, so they're, they're guidance, you don't have to follow them, except that's really where your label is going to come from that lets investors know that you're doing what people think you're supposed to be doing in these instruments. Mm -hmm. um, so on the use of proceeds side, uh, 
ICMA, the International Capital Markets Association, promulgated the green bond principles. There, there's also the social, social bond principles, sustainability bond principles. Those two look just like the green bond principles, except you're talking about um, a different use of proceeds category. Uh, very similarly, ICMA and it promulgated the sustainability linked bond principles, which sets out guidelines there. Uh, the LSTA, um, the LMA have basically picked these up and uh, you know has them for the loan market as well. And that those are really the standards that are being used in these issuances. And you know, there are when you're doing an issuance, you're getting a, a framework or getting a, a second party opinion from an external provider that basically says these are the requirements of those guidelines and here's how you're you're meeting them. Um, there's also kind of separate certifications out there, um, like climate bond certifications, but these these two, uh, the sustainability link bond principles and the green bond principles, social bond principles, those are really the main ones. So much so that, and I'll stop talking in a second, there are uh, there have been a lot of companies that aren't yet ready to put in sustainability link provisions into their debt. I'm going to talk about credit agreements, really, that are putting in like an ESG amendment provision, which says we're not ready, but in the future, we're going to put this provision in. And yes, we're talking about something that impacts pricing, but it only requires majority lender vote, not unanimous lender vote, which is usually the rule for something that impacts pricing. And those provisions typically say, and what we put in will be in alignment with the sustainability linked loan principles. Um, so you're really seeing that those are the two main principles. I'll, I'll turn it over. That's good. That's, that's, a, that's a good breakdown. I suppose, you know, flicking to the other side of the value chain, Will, Michaela, do you, do you see a kind of a preference from, you know, a lot of them would be retail investors that, that are looking to put together a portfolio. Do you see it? Do you, do you, you know, on your side, do you see a, uh, a preference or a shifting preference for one type of instrument over another? I wouldn't say so. I think it's really, um, so we haven't seen this too, to be quite honest. I think for, for the clients, it's more important the message which is behind it mm. and also the outcome which is aligned to it, right? So it's more important to the client which structure it has is probably not so much in, in the for, at the forefront. It's really like, what do we actually achieve with it? Mm. So maybe I take a step back here because you, you talked about impact finance. To be very precise, so personally here within um, UBS Global Wealth Management, we are not putting the green or the sustainable bond environment into the impact environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is, or as we define, not define them as impact investments. Yes, it becomes more clearer, the more transparent the instruments get, the more measurable it gets, but we define really impact investing as a very intentional investment where you have full transparency, where you have a measurable and defined or precise outcome you want to achieve with your investments. So this is slightly different from what we really have in this whole sustainable environment. Yes, there is impact attached to it. So impact in the sense of measure measurable, um, you know, targets and, and um, you know, um, Kathleen talked about the transition process. These are very important topics. So this is probably here in the forefront. So we need to basically be very clear with our clients that all these instruments are contributing to a transition process. So we need to be also quite clear because often it is misleading. So some people think when they buy green bonds that this is like already the greenest kind of investments they can do and they're already you know, thinking about the end result they're actually investing in. But in fact, we need to keep in mind that the green bond is only a part of the balance sheet of an issuer. And it's part of the whole transition process of the whole business um, the, uh, the issuer wants to go through. Mm -hmm. So how does he achieve it or how does the issuer achieve it? It doesn't really matter, right? So it's down to the flexibility, what is suitable best for the issuer, but then probably become later to, the, to discuss it. It's a causing more a problem at our ends. And I think Will and I, we have some, some things to share about this because it's more the assessment. How do you really know 
what is really green? Is it dark green? Is it light green? Um, you know, can we really um, rely on SLBs, the targets which I said, etc. But that's a different topic slightly. Yeah. Yeah, just to, sorry to just jump in on what you were saying, Michaela. Yeah, there's you, the point you make of a green bond can might just be like a really small part of a company's debt uh, debt in their capital structure, right? So there's there's nothing that says if you do a you know two hundred million dollar green bond that you can't go do a billion dollars to finance some you know really dirty for the climate uh, project or or operations as well. Yeah, and I think on that point, Kaylin, this is where I think investors have to look beyond the ICMA green bond principles. I think the principles are a great starting point, but what I would emphasize from the investor's point of view is that having your own framework and to look in the weeds of these issues and at the issuer holistically uh, makes sense. And that's obviously depending on your, your objectives, but from an impact investor, we are not just taking this green label. We're not taking that as the gospel. We have to look at, at the issuer's overall practices and from an ESG standpoint, and really understand, are we financing something that is more sustainable? Um, or is this just a labeled issue, which is, is one small part of a larger capital structure? I, I saw a question that we received, which was, why should the investor receive the benefits of the issuer's failure to meet targets? And why aren't the penalties put towards green slash sustainable projects? Um, good question. I'm gonna answer the question by not answering the question. Uh, and I wish I had, my chart that I mentioned at the very beginning that just hours and hours had gone into. Uh, but there is actually, uh, there's at least one issuance out there where the banks did commit to using any interest increase to fund projects um, with the same same targeted goals. Uh, so that was, that was something that like stuck out to me as I was looking at deals of, wow, that's, that's really great. Like that makes, me feel good. We're all doing good, and and that's the only one I've seen. Uh, so there there is at least one out there for that. Yeah, I mean, I think the point there really is. It, it depends on your philosophy, but I think the point is is that the 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 investors are are trying to incentivize the right behavior, and and you know I appreciate that. Obviously, could maybe be there are there are ways in which that can be be achieved otherwise, but in uh, at the moment, I think that that's the overall goal of it. Um, just switching gear a little bit. Um, one of the things you you know we were talking about here is 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 about all this demand for this kind of green financing, sustainable financing. Do 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 you think? I mean, maybe I'll start with you, Caitlin. You know, in terms of your conversations with 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 issuers and investment banks and things like this. But is there a, a like the a, a premium or a, a greenium, which I hate that word. It's a composite word. But yeah, is there is there kind of a premium? Are a kind of a demand benefit in pricing, I suppose, that that issuers receive. I mean, it's relatively obvious in sustainable, sustainably linked, right? Because it, it generally there's a mechanism there for it to change the pricing. But I suppose it's a little more difficult to measure in the green bond kind of use of use of proceeds bond, social bond context. Is that something you 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 know? Is that a question that you encounter a lot from issuers when they're first going down this road? Um, and I suppose then. You know, after that, I'd be interested to see if Michaela or Will think that that uh, they feel that investors are are willing to um, provide a um, you know better pricing for 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 green instruments. Yeah, so I, I think the answer is still yes, and I but I think it's diminishing to some extent. Um, I was looking into this a little bit here recently, and you know, like. 2019, early 2020, you saw issuances being like six times oversubscribed, right? And and that gives a lot of flexibility to bring down pricing. And now I think it's more two to three times oversubscription, um, which still, I mean, the deal is two to three times oversubscribed, but you know that's been cut in half basically. So you're seeing that, I think that decline a little bit. Um, but is, is that a function? Is that really just a function of the fact that now that we have more supply of green financing, that investors and maybe Will and Michaela can talk to us, but investors are going to be choosier around which green uh, financings and which sustainable financings they're 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 going to actually give their support to. I think that's right, and and I think Will kind of touched on that. You know, 
looking beyond the label, right, and, and looking more at companies holistically. I, you know, I think the story is probably more about access, increasingly more about access to capital. Um, you know, a, a certain companies that maybe work in dirtier industries might be able to keep keep banks in their bank group or attract investors that otherwise would have felt pressured to leave the credit by having sustainability linked provisions. Um, and, and I think that's a really powerful part of what's going on. And I think that's, again, like I mentioned over subscription, I think having investor interest is what drove pricing and having over subscription versus going out and saying, if you do this green bond, you know, it's just going to be 50 basis points lower. Right. Yeah. And just to, just to pick up on, on one of the things you said, Noel, I think that there's a novelty effect really in certain sectors when it comes to labeled issuance. And, and what we've witnessed is that there's more green bonds or more labeled bonds are actually issued within a sector that that greenium dissipates. So I would certainly expect it to, to dissipate to an extent over time. And we've witnessed that in, in European utilities, for example. So the greenium is now a lot smaller than it was before. But ultimately, um, it's, it's a supply and demand dynamic. And I think as much as supply is rapidly increasing, I think demand, investor demand, is going to uh, continue to outstrip supply. And as Caitlin said, it also does come down to the quality of that issue or, or that holistic view that we have. So I just want to take two good examples from late last year. We had the EU green bond and the UK green bond, and they were both enormously oversubscribed. They were 11 and 12 times oversubscribed, respectively. So a greenium does exist, but it is diminishing to an extent. And I, I would hope that over time, as the, as the supply demand dynamic just balances out a bit, that, that we'd see that dissipate. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, just going going with that theme that was that was picked up. Maybe I'll ask Michaela, and and, and then you will to, to speak to this. You know, there's there's to what extent or how are you finding investors trying to analyze the the ESG or or or, or impact of their own portfolio, and to what extent do they want? as much information and how are they going about making sure they get that information and then once you've spoken to that caitlin i'd like you to then maybe speak to how the transparency around relevant whether it's kpis and sustainability linked in, um, investments or, or or debt versus the reporting on the development of use of proceeds and green projects how issuers and uh, are, are, are approaching that as well. So maybe I'll, we start first from the investor side and the kind of the level of scrutiny. And I suspect it's it's only increasing. Um, but to, to hear from maybe Michaela to, uh, to start around how um, they're they're seeing investors wanting to synthesize that information. Well, it's one of the biggest topics in the market right now, right? So. Um... It helped, obviously, what Kathleen was talking about before, that we have certain kind of standards, the principles in the market, right? And particularly getting in Europe now the European sort of the green bond standards or so kind of regulation type um, will help because what is needed is really a standardization. So because um, Kathleen was talking about the sustainably linked bonds versus the green bonds, it's very difficult like from an institutional investor point of view yes you have the resources you have the capabilities partly right. to really do this analysis but we are talking to retail investors so for them it's basically the label they are buying right of mm -hmm. course it's down to us like as an institution to select the right um, investments for them and to make sure that what we are putting onto our selection screen for them that this is basically um, as sustainable as it can get but nevertheless, the point is really like the more, you know, it's clear, I, I said early on, it's shifting a little bit to an issuer market now because more issuers coming to the market, they want, they're demanding partly a little bit more flexibility, particularly with the sustainability linked bonds where they can put their own kind of targets at play, which is fantastic to a certain degree. But if I'm sitting at the other receiving end and I have like a portfolio of a hundred or um, 150 different names and I need to analyze each different target and I need to not only analyze it once but i have to continuously follow it through to see what really happens to see if any triggers are um 
affected by it um it is becoming extremely complex right, right. so it is really like a standardization we need in the market we need um actually we need this regulation we need the principles we need particular labeling um third party providers who help us to do the selection process and to do the verification process because it is impossible we cannot basically put this um, structure on to retail clients who do not have any of these kind of capacities at all and they just need to be certain when they buy a green bond a social bond sustainability bond climate aligned bond whatever it is put a name to it um, that it's really in the package what they are buying yeah it, I'm just going to jump in and I'll get to the, the question but I think this is a, a really interesting topic that you're raising Michaela and it's one that I think about which doesn't necessarily like in, affect my day-to-day -day job you know in the in the green bond the use of proceeds bond world there is there is a, a project theoretically, where someone has said this project is going to have this impact on the environment or is going to have this impact on um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then as an investor, I can say, OK, well, my investment in here is going to have, you know, it has this level of impact. Well, on the sustainability linked side, it, like the whole point of that instrument is that companies are all in different places and, and this is a transition. and you can't really like one size fits all it and then also make it useful um, to companies. It, it just doesn't, the two don't really compute, but then from an investor perspective, how do I possibly like measure the impact for on my portfolio of all these disparate standards? Um, I don't have a solution. I just think it's really interesting. Um, but on to Noel, to your question, you know, I think in, when the green bond principles and the sustainability linked principles first came out, um, it was verification is reporting and verification are, are crucial. I think they kind of left it up to a, a fact specific scenario about, well, for some companies, you maybe have the infrastructure, maybe they have public reporting requirements and they don't really have to go through an external verification process, you know, but every case needs to be evaluated. External verification though, you know, we recommend, I think now it's basically there's external verification and there's enough service providers out there competing for work to pr provide that at competitive rates. But, it, you know, I do think now that's where everything is going is that the company will report and then the results will be, you know, externally verified by a third party, whether it be an auditor, whether it be a, consulting firm, um, they will provide assurance or verification on, on the metrics. Yep. Before we go to the next question, I just, I see there's a, there's a question, I mean, there's a couple of questions here, but one of the, one of the more interesting ones is to hear from the panelists about whether this discussion about impact versus green versus sustainable demonstrates the difference between North American and kind of Western European attitudes and approaches to sustainable finance. Um, I mean, just going just going first myself. Like, I think I'll, I I do a lot of work both in the U.S. and in and in Europe, and I definitely think that in terms of um, green finance, generally speaking, um, Europe it, it is definitely one of the areas where Europe has kind of led led the charge. What I would say is is that increasingly, I mean, the debt markets in the U.S. are obviously larger, and I would say increasingly, as evidenced by by Caitlin being here and 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 all the conversations we're having with a lot of clients in the U.S., I think that um, the U the U.S. is 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 very much quickly quickly catching up so i don't know i don't know if there's a as much of a difference in in, in attitudes or maybe just a difference in timing but i i feel that you know there whilst europe you know the european standards and and maybe the the volume of 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 these types of debt instruments um you know started um yeah you know, or was greater in europe uh, I, I have a strong suspicion that in, in two to three years' time, that the U.S. market will be will be significantly larger in in, in this sense. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think that that's my experience. I don't know, Caitlin, if you want to. No, I, I I mean just even practically, right? Like when I said I started emailing who's working on this, right? You guys were working on them in London, and uh, you know, then the green bond started in our U.S. offices, and now it's just like everything. Uh, everything all at once. My my inbox is probably full of 
deal emails when we get off of this. So um, that's definitely what the the reporting shows. That's what the issuances show, but it's also the practical experience. Yeah, and what, what I would add there is, I think from a client perspective, is, is there is a huge le level of interest in sustainable debt from both the Europeans, which I'm in contact with, and the US. And I think, to your point, Noel, the may just be a slight lag, certainly in, in terms of regulation. But that being said, the European regulation, at least in my view, still has uh, some way to go. So we've spoken many times about the principles, but I think from the investor's perspective, or from the client's perspective, we have to go beyond those principles. And, and that's why we're looking at bonds on a bond by bond basis. And that also ties into the point you're making about impact sort of measurement reporting. It is difficult under the um, existing frameworks unless you develop something proprietary. Yeah. But Which I means, think, yeah, sorry, Michaela, go ahead. No, it's it's really quite interesting. I just wanted to uh, to reiterate what what we just said. So basically, the interest is definitely here, and but also I'm always a fan to really do a historic look back and, and what is really the driver, and what we shouldn't forget is really what I said in the beginning. It's like, how does a government give a give a line up, you know, what is really important, right? So if you have an infrastructure, if you have a you know, government guidance, if you have a government which is behind the whole kind of transition process, it makes life much, much easier for everybody in the value chain, if it's the investor, if it's the issuer. I doubt that there is less interest in the US. It was really just a matter of that there wasn't enough kind of incentive given by the government structures so far. Um, we have seen it a little bit as a um, um, opposition to the Trump government. So that was like when Trump said he wants to leave the Paris Climate Agreement, we have seen, um, you know, on a um, subnational level, a step up. We have seen companies stepping up, etc. But now, with being Biden's in, in Biden in power and having given from the start this as an agenda topic, well, it's a different a level what he can get through on a political level. But it's really just talking about it, putting it up on the agenda, giving, you know, the security to everybody within the infrastructure that this is on the agenda and this is will be driven forward this is actually already a, a mind changing process um, across the board yeah um i suppose that conversation and, and some of the other stuff that we've said earlier kind of leads to another one which is to do with the kind of skepticism um that folks have around the use of um ESG, esg debt instruments or esg investments as a as a form of kind of greenwashing and you know the the point that that's been made kind of by all of you separately is you know particularly take, take for example sustainability linked instruments you know the issuer will set the target and will obviously want to set a target that they can meet um, and i'm sure that that creates an attention on the on the investor side to make sure that the the money they're giving over to market participants is being used to kind of drive real change so and um, you know, a number of the questions that we've gotten um, during this have, have talked about things like potential regulatory arbitrage posing an issue in terms of the you know the disparate um, kind of different principles and 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 regulations around this. I mean, how do you how do you see that cynicism and skepticism around the industry? What's your what's your take on it? Maybe Michaela, we'll start with you, and then we'll. Well, I don't see it as a cynicism. Um, it's basically we are all scared of greenwashing, right? So this is be the new bad word um, in in the agenda of everybody, right? So we went all from a very strong enthusiasm. Everybody, I would I always think of the best of everybody, right? So in, in everybody went ahead and said like, okay, I'm doing the best as, uh, towards my knowledge, but we all develop further. It's a growing, it's a developing market. And with that, we actually have to question if it's good enough what we did a while ago, right? So it's an always improving, we have more knowledge, we have more data. It is a changing, it's a moving environment and we should never ever forget that. So, and the other thing is sustainability is not black and white and it's like, um, said earlier no one there's no one right way to do things right so we also keep, need to keep this in mind but coming back to the point i had earlier it's really the complexity really um the, the skepticism is really coming because suddenly with the growth everybody coming to this topic everybody developing new products which is exciting on the one level but the complexity 
complexity makes also people a little bit afraid of it. It's afraid of the own success, right? And I think this is something we need to manage. And it's really like, um, again, coming to the point of greenwashing. But here again, it's like we have particular in Europe, various regulations coming into place. We are all reviewing it. It's, re it's a learning process on a daily basis. I mean, I'm working with the various legal teams on this and internally, and it's daily discussions. How do we report this correctly? Is this well understood? Is this what the regulator wants from us? There is also different views which need to come together. And it's literally a learning price process on a daily basis. And just to tag on to the, the back of that, uh, agree, the skepticism I think is, is understandable. When you, whenever you see a market grow like this, um, there is going to be some skepticism uh, and without the current regulatory framework in place, I, I think that is to an extent justified. But, but what that really highlights to me is the importance of all the market participants working together. So whether that's issuers, investors or you know, the legal representation of those issuers uh, in order to ensure that these deals aren't only built in the interests of issuers, but also in the issuers of invest uh, in the interests of investors. And what that can mean is that these deals are actually built to generate meaningful change and that this isn't just some piggyback on, on, um, on the momentum of the sustainable debt market. So I think it is important that the market participants work together um, in order to, to quash that. But as I said, I think some, some of the, uh, the cynicism is to be expected. Well, I think that's, I love that you said that. I think the people who come out on top here are going to be the people who take the time to understand the perspective of everyone involved and everyone involved in the process and where where they have questions, where what they're trying to solve for, um, and not just being zoned in on on your one particular point of view. And that's why like having this, these conversations is is so useful. Um, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, before we go to the you know the final question, I just want to pick up on a couple of other questions we received from different folks. So. One was here. What do you observe in the market? Are, are green bonds, are the KPIs for sustainability bonds, are they generally in line with the respective companies' overall sustainability strategy? Um, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I think that, you I mean, Caitlin, you can speak to that, but I think that often in sustainability bonds, number one, I think that you, you find a lot of that at more at the investment grade level. Um, it's trickling down into into non-investment grade, um, similar to how green bonds really were typically an investment grade instrument and now I've moved towards non-investment grade as well. But I, I, I tend to find that my own experience is that with sustainability linked products, it, it's, it's often part of a larger, um, an, an issue with a larger um, goal um, at the kind of company and governance level uh, around their sustainability and how their company is going to get run for the future. And their finance product is actually um, a kind of symptom of it, not, not the driving force behind it. I, I agree with that. And I think there's there's just a distinction to be made. Um, if you're doing a use of proceeds issuance, like your your framework is around that project, not your company's strategy and goals. And the sustainability link side, as you were mentioning, Noel, it's, it's intended to be kind of a tool in the company's tool belt to further their sustainability goals. Um, so it's just a little bit, they're two different kind of creatures. Yeah. Um, the, the other question I would highlight before we go to this last one, which is, which is interesting, is someone's asked, should, should executive compensation be, be linked to achieving ESG goals? And they talk about the SEC, SEC recently having commentary around disclosure rules, of course, which is very well um, kind of reported, uh, and executive pay um, versus company performance. So should ESG metrics, I mean, obviously the SEC only, re um, only regulates, well, until last week, until they decided they're going to also regulate, I suppose, private funds. But typically, they only regulate um, public companies. Um, but I suppose taking the theme of that question, maybe putting it to, to Miguel and Will, do, do you find that that uh, that maybe any the investors that you're dealing with and the public investors are 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 generally looking for a level of commitment from companies around DSG, and they're looking past just the debt issuance? There, you know, it sounds like that's something, Will, that particularly you were noting that. They're, they're, they really are digging into the companies themselves. Um, and, and I suppose executive compensation would just be one strand of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think 
executive compensation obviously ties into to the the governance um if we're breaking down esg it ties into the the governance aspect of the company so um really it, it's a question i i don't personally have a view you on um but what i would say is that assessing the governance and assessing the e s and g strand of the issuers in which we invest forms part of our process and this is also something that our clients um and our our, our um investors are all looking at themselves so um it's part of our thesis that we that we wouldn't um invest in, in bad actors and i think this just forms part of that mosaic so um yeah. when we're assessing the, the g level that that forms yeah a part okay final question which of course the easiest one what does the future development of the sustainable or the green debt market look like what do you i mean maybe i'll i'll ask michaela first how, how do you see the the development maybe over the, over the next kind of 12 to 18 months well it's exciting, right? Um, there's lots of developments. I think we are still on a growing path. There's still a lot of potential there, um, particularly when we go also into emerging markets um, in, in the Asian countries, which is still, um, um, I don't want to say a green field, but it's still like um, an area which can be further developed and, and mm -hmm. people have high interest because particularly there, we can um, achieve a lot of um, transition processes which will contribute to the sustainable development goals. Um, I think, as we have seen in the past, like um, there is so much creativity around, so there will be new pro products created, which is great, right? So because um, actually sustainability is not happening overnight, we need new ideas, we need new structures, we really need to understand what is the best and easiest way forward for, for all of us, right? And it is not taking place overnight. If you want to become sustainable, it takes time and that instruments are potentially the right instrument to accompany that process because you need commitment, you need basically patience to become sustainable. And in and this is at the source or at the core of that instrument. So maybe um, the capital is more patient, um, which will enable companies to, to go through this transition path. Um, so yeah, it, I see, foresee hopefully a very good and exciting um, so a year or two years and, and future to come for us. Thanks, Michaela. What about you, Will? How do you, how do you see the, what's your, what's your predictions? Yeah, so I'll break it down to growth, uh, I think regulation and, and innovation. So so growth, jumping, jumping on the back of Michaela's point, I think specifically in EM, we're seeing EM sovereigns and EM corporates really harness the sustainable um, debt market. They have the, the UN SDG funding gap at the moment. So they're going to have to find uh, financing in order to, to close that gap. I think in terms of regulation, uh, Michaela referred to the European Green Bond Standard that might be on the way. What I could do really is create this pricing dynamic in the market of those who do comply will find that they are better priced than those who don't and it could wean out any bad actors. And then finally, innovation, you know, sustainability linked bonds are relatively new compared to, to green bonds. But I think what we expect to see is further um, sustainable debt instruments, the French and, and the US are talking about green inflation linked bonds, for example, so certainly some innovation, but overall, uh, a lot to be excited about. Cool. Thank you, Will. And Caitlin, what uh, other than doing more deals? What, what, what in this space? What, what other what other? Uh, I see a lot more deals. I see yeah. a lot more deals in our future. <laughs> no, I, I agree with everything that Will and, and Michaela said. Um, and, you know, I, I think there will be some amount of standardization. And, you know, as more and more service providers and, and uh, certification programs come around, I think it'll get a little bit easier for, hopefully, for investors to, um, to parse out what they want to be a part of, what's a good investment, and, and what has risk of greenwashing. Okay, Tony, I'm going to hand back to you um, for any Q and A. We we'll probably run a little bit over time, but um, the, the, there's going to be no Q and A, I'm afraid, because um, we, we've got less than a minute to go. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, for for, for a great discussion. Um, to me, the one of the really fascinating things that comes out of this is is this incredible lag of um, supply um, compared to demand. Um, and anecdotally, I feel like the um, you know, the, the oversubscription is, has been increasing recently rather than coming down, which means there's more money coming into the market looking for 
deals, um, but not enough deals around. So you'd assume that the future is rosy for Vincent Elkins in terms of the number of deals because that they've got to be brought to the market. Um, but thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to Vincent Elkins for being a sponsor of this. Um, obviously, Caitlin, Noel, Michaela um, and Will, thank you very much all for, for great participation. And of course, thank you very much to the audience as well. Thank you for listening. As I mentioned earlier on, this webinar will be available on demand very shortly. Um, the URL that you can see there is the one that you're on right now. So don't worry about having to, to copy and paste that. Um, you'll be emailed very shortly. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you again. And I hope everybody has a, a very sustainable day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye.